Judas of Borg. Cool. Now, what the hell was my intro? All right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is Layman Pascal, and this is an integral stage series. We're talking with podcasters, YouTubers, and internet salon hosts who are trying to offer or who can't help but offer um, more integrative perspectives. That means a focus on transforming, transcending, integrating, enlivening, upgrading, evolving within hybrid, more complex, deeper, meta-level, or depth-oriented spaces and practices. Who are the people doing this? What do they collectively understand and point towards? Um, how can they be interlinked, mutually supported, clarified, and amplified? That's our project. We'll see what emerges. Today to help us think through this is Matt from Tiny Cupboard, who hosts Philosophical Zoom Salons broadcast on YouTube. <laughs> oh yeah, thanks for having me, Lehman. Hey Matt. I understand you've got a focus on uh, music and comedy and you're trying to include more philosophy. I'd like to know why the hell you're doing that. <laughs> first of all, who's Amy? Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Let's go through Amy first. Amy is my girlfriend actually. Um, and um, me and Amy started uh, a, a kind of DIY like underground venue in Brooklyn, New York um, in July of last year, 2019. Um, and we did this out of kind of actual frustration of both trying to get our businesses off the ground in, in an online format and realizing like the online space is kind of passive and, and just, it doesn't feel like whole and, and it feels like something's missing in the online space that there's not a full kind of participatory communication compared to live events. Um, so both of us got really interested in this idea of like, hosting live events in real life uh, last year. And um, we started doing a whole bunch of uh, all kinds of different things like immersive events, music events, comedy events. Um, and that lasted pretty much up until March, mid-March in, uh, in Brooklyn, where we actually had to shut down um, uh, these live events due to the coronavirus. Um, but kind of immediately when we were kind of primed for this opportunity to be like, to kind of adapt back to the online space. And instead of doing it in the old kind of social media scrolling passive way, we wanted to do live events um, um, using Zoom because Zoom just started becoming more popular again. Um, or, you know, not, not again, but it just started becoming really popular. Um, and we're treating Zoom as kind of like our venue. Um, and it's enabled us to think bigger, I think. Uh, and, and we didn't really, we felt like we didn't really have the maybe, maybe like bandwidth or reach to do philosophy salons at our actual venue in Brooklyn. But now that we can target any author or any person in the world and kind of attract any audience we want, now we feel like a lot more is possible, including philosophy. How do people find out what you're working on and access it. Oh, you're right. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, we're, we're called the tiny cupboard. Um, and uh, you can Google us. Um, we're the tiny And uh, we have about two events going on on zoom every single day. Um, we host all kinds of things, literary stuff, philosophy stuff, music stuff, comedy stuff. So uh, we're, we're always experimenting. So if you want to check out our website or Instagram or whatever, um, we're on, you know, all the channels. All right. Where does the name Tiny Cupboard come from? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Um, me and Amy, my girlfriend, uh, we were looking for a, um, a venue um, that, you know, we're in Brooklyn and we're, we're looking for like a space that we can host events out of that was, that was a reasonable budget. So our first step was looking for actually a place that we can live and uh and work out of like at the same time so like a store that secretly had like a basement where we could have a bed um and that was our deal our ideal setup was like having a venue and then sleeping on in the basement we could not find that for a reasonable budget Re real estate is really expensive in new york renting is really sp expensive in new york the only thing we could find was this very tiny thing that was meant to be an art studio for photography and production um, this was the only thing within our budget and, um, we, you know, nobody, nobody would look at this and say, oh, that's a great event space, but we, that's how we looked at it. Um, so we turned this kind of really tiny art studio into 
uh, a venue where we have like we shove 20 or 30 people in there and and like put on an event um and uh the only reasonable thing we could have called it is the tiny cupboard (laughs) (laughs) so it seems like you are interested in maybe even obsessed with events what is it that attracts you to the experience and also to the concept of the event. Yeah, so I mean, that's a great question. Events are, even as like a participant, I've always been interested in events, um, like looking for meetups, looking for things to do, um, and kind of having that be the organizer of my social life. And um, I think that, you know, events are naturally where people come together, they're where people communicate, they're where like uh, people from different cultures and perspectives come together and you can meet people. And um, this idea of like a party or just like bringing someone together and and like, and like having people clash in in a certain space, that's interesting. Even though I'm an introvert, that's like, that's interesting to me for a number of reasons, just because it's, it's like, it's a gathering point um, and it's where things happen. And uh, also in in terms of a, a media kind of way or kind of an artistic way, events compared to let's say putting something on youtube which is fine events feel more lively and they feel more like participatory um and and it's just i think it's where the most energy comes out compared to any other sort of medium of of creation so uh, it sounds to me like something about the immediacy and something about the uh collision of perspectives and energies of people involved yeah, yeah, absolutely. About it being a multi-party, interactive, unpredictable phenomenon. Oh, certainly, absolutely, and 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 that's a huge part of it is it, it being interactive and participatory. Um, I think a lot of us are experiencing this kind of fatigue of like being on social media or watching Netflix or like going on YouTube and passively consuming a lot of information. And there's ways to participate using social media, but we're simply just texting in a, in a, in a box. And, and it often for me, doesn't feel like quite enough. Um, and even, even, even certain events, I don't think they do it well enough. Like it's, it's still too passive and it's still like, you're kind of just spectator. You're just a spectator. Um, but events at least give you the opportunity to, to fully immerse yourself in, in, in other people or in another world or like something um, in a way that, not a lot of other, not a lot of other mediums can do. It sounds like you're setting a pretty high bar for immersion and interactivity because <laughs> like I think back over human history and I imagine, you know, a papal or royal edict coming out, right, and then a few hundred years go by, and then you've got a lot of authors, and each one of them puts his ideas down and <laughs> sends them out, and then you got a whole bunch of TV channels and they're going out, and then you got the internet. Uh, then you've got to like more amateur, flexible versions of the internet, and you're right down to Twitter and YouTube. And from your point of view, that's still too passive, monological, and formal. <laughs> you want to go I, past that? Yes, I mean I think that <laughs> they're they're still good. They're still good things. And I, you know, I I have a blog, and like I I I, I participate in YouTube. Um, but if we're talking about a spectrum of like, uh, I guess intensity or a spectrum of engagement um i would put events at live in real life events at the top um um assuming that there's like an immersive interactive component but that doesn't mean that the other things are aren't aren't useful as well um so they're all useful but do you think the the culture is still too weighted in that direction like one of the questions when you get involved in philosophy and things like that it's still pretty dominated by lecturers and authors that's true. <laughs> um, for me, philosophy becomes most alive when it's social. Um, and I mean, I mean, naturally it's, it, it is kind of both. It's like, it is most philosophy that I, I consume and read. I, I mean, I do it on my own and it's a very solitary activity, but then it feels like it really comes to life when we bring it into this social space. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I guess I guess you're right. Like there there is a need for just this kind of isolated consumption of something, just so you can gather your thoughts and kind of reflect on it without any kind of mediation. Um, but you know, to fully bring that idea concrete and and to give it life, then then it feels like that 
social component is necessary. Uh, yeah, yeah. How much of this do you think is new? Like uh, a novel moment of history, new technology is being taken advantage of. And how much of it do you think is a return to a really ancient style? Because I know, yeah. you know, the ancient Greek philosophers, basically they met in small groups and walked around chatting with each other. That was the version. Yeah. The, so yeah how much sure. of this is archaic revival and how much of this is novel? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, of course, I think a lot of it is rooted in that kind of tribalism that, that, that's, that's an essential piece of culture and that's really important. Um, but of course we have new technologies now that make it easier to get together with certain interest groups that you would normally not have access to if you were only born in like a Greek society. Um, the fact that I can organize an event around a really weird subculture is exciting because even in Brooklyn, New York, there's a ton of people in New York, but even here I can't get as specific as I can with hosting like a zoom event and just in the past two months alone there's been i think there's been a small shift towards and and, and if for anyone watching this in future it's may it's may 2020 and uh <laughs> and it's um it's we're two months into you know coronavirus quarantine um and there's been a shift in my opinion towards like people hanging out on zoom and more video chat and doing more stuff like this and FaceTime, um, as opposed to, as opposed to more, the more passive sort of social media consumption. And, uh, I don't think that'll go away, but I, I do think that it's that suddenly we're seeing more people using the technology that we're given. Um, but there is something, yeah, that's very, that's very ancient about it too. But I think what makes it better now is the ability to target interest groups. That's an interesting piece. Like, obviously, Plato could get um, a dozen fans of Socrates together. <laughs> yeah. But hypothetically, you can get, uh, you know, albino philosophical S&M fetishists from all over the planet <laughs> together. <laughs> exactly. Hypothetically, we could do that. <laughs> and that's, that's exciting because, you know, the point of an event is to bring people together and, and in a way just – without even getting abstract, like it's just to get people to bond. Um, and I think the more specific you go, specific you go sometimes, that's, that's the easier it is to get those people to bond. We host emo nights, for example, for people that like emo music. And it's only for those people and only those people show up. Um, and they're really fun just because it's for that specific subculture and, and these people get each other. And there's a lot of there's a lot of kinds of uh, uh, subcultures that we can encompass by doing by doing events. So you got the purpose of an event is to bring people together, but then there's a second level purpose, which is to bond the people who've been brought together. Yeah, and that's a lot easier if they have a bunch of things in common. Yeah. But what else do you think, in your experience, helps that bonding? Like, like not every event achieves the same degree of bonding. So what right. contributes to the bonding? Yeah. So I mean there has to be structure um, to an event and we we've done a lot of different events. We've done comedy. We've done, we've done music, as I've said, um, um, people are naturally awkward, I think. And uh, it, it's, you need some sort of structure to get people to open up and talk to each other. Um, and usually having some sort of artistic base, like let's say they listen to comedians um, do 10 minute sets. And this is a natural structure of our, some of our events. We have um, four performers do like each 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and then by the time it's done or in the middle of it, we have, we have intermissions briefly throughout. Um, it breaks the ice a little bit. It gets people to talk. And ultimately a successful event, in my opinion, is not just we watch the comedians or we watch the musicians, but that but the comedians or the musicians or whoever the performers are enable the audience to break the ice in a certain way um and then hopefully continue to have a dialogue and kind of philosophical part or just a discussion honestly um and uh and that that completes the event in my opinion is when is when people really start breaking out of the actual performance of it and then go to their own groups and start actually connecting Seems like that's a fine, there's a fine line there between uh, the performer as icebreaker and coordination point for the group and the danger of the group fetishizing the performer and acting like yeah. it's the be all and end all of the event. 
Absolutely. And I think what's special about the tiny cupboard um, is we're so small and we're so like immersive that the wall between audience and performer is kind of broken. Um, we actually don't have a stage at our venue and the stage itself creates this kind of, um, um, it, it creates a, a presentation of the performer as the, the, the spectacle of the event. Um, but when you don't have a stage that those boundaries are broken down, the performer is just as anxious as the audience and the audience feels like they're also performing in a way because they are performing. They're, they're, they're reacting to, to the performers. They're included in the event somehow. And in that way, we want the performers to stick around and talk to the audience members afterwards. Um, and for the audience to feel just as part of the performance as, as the performers. In uh, meet space events, uh, embodiment is a huge factor. Like people can come together with the idea that they're either, you know, maybe I'm a little bit anxious about events or maybe I'm the kind of person who thinks I'm super social and I love events or whatever it is. And everybody's got a certain kind of stress shell that they bring into it that has to be diffused so they can get involved with each other. And a lot of that is physical in traditional events. True. Right? That... Uh, you got to breathe right. You got to be near people. You, you have a drink, you laugh, you jump around, whatever it is. Um, what do you think fulfills that role when it comes to digital events? Um, yeah, I'm still figuring that out, honestly, because, you know, we've hosted actually quite a lot of events in the past two months. Um, but every time we host an event, we learn a little more about how to do it better and how to execute it better. Um, and, and there's a lot of challenges to doing it only digital and not having the physical component. We, we understood, uh, we learned, um, I think in November, how important food is and, and wine for, for just loosening people up. Um, and it sounds really obvious, but we tested events where we had a chef um, versus not having a chef. And the difference is really like astronomical in terms of simply the fact that people have a burrito in their hands and can eat it and it makes them feel comfortable. It opens them up and it makes them feel less awkward. And we don't necessarily have that um, on zoom or things like that. And we expect that some people might lose interest. Like usually if 30 people show up to an event on zoom, we expect that at least five to 10 of them might bounce um, in the middle of it. While in real life, we wouldn't expect, we wouldn't really expect that. So, I mean, we're still learning about the kind of um, culture and, and, and whatnot of Zoom um, and how to break that ice. It's definitely more challenging, uh, but the more the audience participates in whatever format. Yesterday we had, you know, we had Steve's uh, philosophy salon and I thought it went very smooth because all the audience members naturally just asked a question, participated, and 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 they were part of the event um and that really helped that really helped but it's not always like that how do you uh, i mean here's a when i do collective zoom things one of the problems you run into a lot is the people who want to speak are a certain kind of person <laughs> and a lot of everybody else who might really have something to contribute are the kind of people who won't speak unless they're called <laughs> upon yeah yeah, and obviously, if you're only doing an hour, obviously you can't hear from everybody, so that's Very fine. True. Very but true. if you have enough time, like, what do you make of the difference between opening it up for people to come forward and making sure to go through and access everybody? Yeah, I, I actually prefer the latter, um, making sure to go through and access everyone. We have this event called the Rude Zoom Bar that we just launched last week, and what it is, it's a virtual bar where we have five comedians and, and they're designed to be really rude to the audience members. And I'm, we're still trying to figure out how to properly structure it, but it was very hilarious last week. Um, but one of the things that I'm keeping in mind as I try to plan this event and write it out is how do we actually make sure that all of the audience members feel included? Because ultimately, the more engaged they are, the more they're gonna feel like they're having a really fun experience and, and they're enjoying it. Um, and, and and if, if, they're not, if, they're not, if they're not engaged or participating and someone is dominating the conversation or the, or the experience, they're not, they're, they're not going to feel like they have fun, obviously. So it is a matter of like getting to as many people as 
as possible in, in breadth, but also hopefully in, in depth as well. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and, and I think the host, it's the job of the host or the facilitator and the event creator to, to make sure that we get to as many people as possible and not have anyone kind of dominate the conversation. Uh, there was a spiritual teacher, he deceased for a few years now, Lee Loswick. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he was famous for um, sort of heckling and insulting the audience for a while until he really upset somebody and often would drive someone out. Mm. After that, he felt like the talk would begin, that everyone mm. else had seen an interesting event, but he always felt like in order to get that field established, you had to sort of figure out who ought to be excluded and, and wow. kind of drive them away. Yeah. What do you make of like, what's the host's responsibility in terms of exclusion? And do you think maximum inclusion is always the goal? Yeah. And I would definitely, it's a great question. And, and that, that's a fascinating story. I would definitely say that maximum inclusion is not always the goal. And um, we should, we try our best to disclude people before they even show up. Um, and that means writing, let's say, our marketing material or, or, you know, our event, our event copy, trying to repel anyone who's not a good fit for the event. Um, and hopefully if we did our job correctly, the people who aren't a good fit just don't show up for the event. Um, and, and, and they might not be a good fit for whatever reason. Maybe they're expecting a bigger kind of performance or like a kind of more established artists or something that's not as... We're, we tend to be unpolished and very scrappy. So if people are expecting a more polished experience, it's not for them. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think it's the job from my point of view is to repel them before they even show up so that we don't have to kick anyone out. You, uh, uh, were you saying you'd watched me talking to Jeremy Johnson? Yes, I did. Yes. Uh, Jeremy and I had this interesting discussion about the aesthetic of the internet medium. Hmm. Right. And of course, from the broader perspective, there's a place for all the different styles. But in terms of what you're working on, you know, you're saying rough, you're saying scrappy, you're saying unpolished. Does that strike you as, as the look you're going for? Is that something you think this medium appreciates? Oh, yeah. Like, I appreciate it. Like, I've always appreciated, like, in the particular music tastes I listen to and the stuff that I like, it's I like this kind of indie lo-fi vibe. I've always liked that. Um, someone once said, you know, the 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 worse, no, the better the singer sounds, the 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 more, the the less I trust them or the less I like it. And and it's almost like you know, if the singer sounds rougher or or more or more lo-fi, you kind of appreciate the authenticity more. And I think that's true for a lot of people when it comes to events. They like to see the behind-the-scenes scrappiness of it all. They like to see them being just as much a part of of um of creating of creating the event and being like behind the scenes in it as as you are um and and uh there's this there's something there's there's an authenticity to it that that uh, uh i think a lot of people appreciate i certainly do and i like on the one hand it's very human and, and very ancient. Yes. <laughs> on the other hand i've you know i heard this thing my whole life that uh Back in the day when the peasants had to work outside, people who were pale had status because they didn't have to go out and work in the fields. Mm -hmm. But later when most people started to work in cities and offices, then people with tans had status mm -hmm. because it looked like they got to go outside. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's always intrigued me is whether we live in an age where it's so easy to be polished or to pay to look good, True. that not looking like that is a sign of status and authenticity. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny you know actually I, i've had to study a lot of marketing like when trying to promote this business and uh one of the funny things i found was this marketer said the uglier the uglier his videos look the more views they end up getting which i think is kind of hilarious um because most people think that you know like the more polished and and high and the high production your videos are the better they are the better that they'll do but really it could be the opposite of that this idea about getting comfortable in an event really intrigues me because I know I'm, I'm part of a lot of spiritual and philosophically themed events. And so very often they, you know, there's a meditation, there's a moment of silence, there's everyone's trying to share something intuitive and you go around the circle, whatever it is. But personally, I always feel like I need to do something that throws me off a little bit. Like, mm -hmm. 
I'm going to smoke a cigar. I'm going to put on a crazy <laughs> hat or, you know, I, I'm going to change shirts once the recording starts. Or just something <laughs> where I place myself outside of my concern about performance. Yes. So I can get comfortable. I completely agree with that. I'm the same way. I, I, I'm naturally, I feel awkward at events, especially if I don't know what to do. And I think a lot of people think that too, is, is if they don't have a clear role and there's not like, and, and they're just kind of sitting there, people don't really know what to do. And for me, meditation has never been that great of an icebreaker. Um, but what what is a good icebreaker is like, f- let's give you an example is uh, like an escape room to me is an awesome event because everyone naturally is there. Have you done one? I used to manage an escape room. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love escape rooms and I've done a lot of them. And what's cool to me about an escape room is that you, you, there's a narrative inherent in the room. Everyone is kind of thrown into this situation and it's kind of, it's clear what you should do or at least what you should try to do. Um, and everyone has a role. And if you've ever done an escape room with people that you don't actually know, like if you come, if you go with two friends and then there's a whole family there, you, you probably end up by the end of it really bonding with them just through the act of being thrown into a narrative with them. And I think that the idea of like having this common narrative that maybe it's imaginatory, maybe it's fiction, but just that, enables you to know what to do in this situation or at the event. Um, and the more imagination involved in it, I think the, the better, um, um, that, that helps break the ice. To me, that helps break the ice a lot more than let's say doing like an icebreaker act- activity. Yeah. It seems like from, from when I ran this thing, there's different styles for different people. And I would always try to help people get clear on what it was that they expected or what they were going for, because there's different ways to get that experience, right? For some people that experience comes with the shared victory. Right. And I would say to them, look, if what you want to do is win, because there's going to be a moment when someone's doing something neat and you all gather around to watch. Huh, that's true. What you want to do is win the game and experience that together then that's a terrible moment. You should stay busy. Forget about what everyone else is looking at. Do not go over and enjoy the fact that they found the secret maze. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> However, if what you want is, is a group experience in the process and you're not too concerned about winning, then you absolutely should go over and stand around and see that neat thing that that person found and stand in that moment together for a few minutes. You know, For sure. And that's probably what people sign up for escape rooms for although they might not realize it because you get kind of lost in it and you want to win um but ultimately the point of it is just it's a narrative that you're thrown into and it, it feels immersive and and the more immersive it feels the more the more it, it, it kind of breaks the ice in a natural way yeah you see kids do that a lot you know they come up with and it's a bare bones narrative it's never got huge story to it but it's just enough for them to use as a scaffold yeah, exactly. And, and that's all you really need. Um, the Rude Zoom Bar, we have a very rough narrative that we're trying to like, uh, every every week is a new plot or like, an, it's we're treating it like an immersive sitcom. So um, there's kind of like a new situation at the bar. Um, but it's, it's always very silly. So um, it, it's, it's, it's maybe not that thought out or maybe not that complex, but it's just enough to give people this kind of sense that they're in an imaginary world, um, which enables them to be silly and to be out of, out of character. Um, and then just helps them connect with people. Uh, who else is working on this in your opinion? And is there anybody doing it well, who you admire oh. some versions of what they're up to? Um, yeah, absolutely. So, um, I don't know if you've heard of it, but there's a website called no percentium and, uh, it means no stage and um or it means something like that like like uh theater that doesn't have stage um and the website basically lists it's a guide to everything immersive and it lists all the kinds of events that could be classified as immersive um and immersive is kind of a buzzword in the same way that integral integral is a kind of a buzzword but there's something that's really like meaningful about it. Um, and there's something that's really, that people really latch onto. Um, when we're describing what an immersive 
event is um, compared to a normal event. Like Sleep No More is immersive and Escape Room is immersive. Um, something like, I did this thing called Accomplice in New York City where it, it's basically a play that takes that takes place in the streets of New York. So like you feel like you're in a movie and you don't know who's an actor and who's not an actor. Um, and you're walking around with your friends and there's like a mobster that, you know, starts yelling at this person. You're like, is that a real thing going on? Or is that, is that part of this imaginary world? Um, and then you realize like that's, that's an actor. And then, and then you're, you're involved in it. Um, that's a really good one. Accomplice. Um, me and Amy did this one called Then She Fell, which, which is based off of Alice in Wonderland. And it's, it's very immersive. There's a ton of them though on the website, no percentium. Um, and my friends got me into this, got me into this whole kind of scene. Um, they have their own play in LA called the bar of dreams. Um, Jonathan Pettigo and Alex Leff and, uh, They've been influential. I went to college with them, but they've been influential in kind of making me aware of this space and aware of the possibility of being a producer in this space. And I think there's a lot of overlap, actually, and a lot of kind of synergy between the integral spaces and the immersive uh, immersive theater spaces. Well, speaking of uh, integral spaces, you've been toying around with the concept of a kind of spectrum of types of events. Now, you're not on the spot. You don't have to uh, stand by a complete theory <laughs> but yeah. what kind of thoughts have you had on that um yeah so I, i've been trying to you know i in the past couple of days i tried to like uh, think about a theory of events and 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 think about um what might be an integral theory of events i don't think i succeeded in, in fully in fully kind of uh, figuring out what that is yet um but the way i see it is is music and comedy in a way is inherently a connector like the point of comedy is the comedian is supposed to make people laugh and laughter is a sign of social connection i know like henry bergson had like a, some theories of humor and 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 kind of social connection um but uh in a way if everyone's laughing that means they're all like ex experiencing a shared worldview and a sense of like shared shared meaning um and uh it's a, it's a connector. That being said, I don't know if any of our comedians can be classified as integral or our musicians. Um, it's really hard to pinpoint what exactly an integral artist is. There's been a lot of discussions about this um, and the difference between integral art and good art. Um, what we're doing is just giving a space for artists to share their creativity and and uh, to me, that furthers the integral project by like being a uh, evolving culture and being kind of um, supporting the people that are creating culture and creativity is, is, is that that's the thing that's important to me. And we're supporting that. So I don't I don't know. I don't know what the in integral event is. I, I have some kind of clues that I think that I think immersive events feel to me more integral than spectacle kind of events um but i don't have like a, a theory yet but i if you if you want to talk about like i would like to just like riff off this if you sure, want let's see what we can work out <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, mean, I think the immersive part uh would play into the quadrants thing mm -hmm. right so that you have you have all these these multiple dimensions you got the intersubjective flow as well as your personal observational experience as well as the setup and the procedure going on yeah for sure. Uh, the levels thing is interesting because it's hard to tell what's characteristic of a particular stage of development and what runs through all the stages. Like you might find comedy at all the stages. It would just look a little different at each one. For sure. To me, there's an interesting question. Like in general, who would you guess is a pretty good integral comedian? Who do you like? And who, who do you like whose comedy you think that actually is borderline wise like that's that's yeah, a place yeah. i'd like my mind to be when he makes those jokes yeah. so i can <laughs> tell you but i feel like com comedy also exposes maybe a, a shadow and a dark side of things um like i really like john mulaney louis ck um um ali wong i don't know i, I don't know if 
if we can classify them as integral or not, it's hard for me to say, cause I don't, I don't know who these people are personally. Um, but who do you like comedically? I would say, I mean, I, I get a strong vibe from Louis CK's material. Yeah. That he's talking about evolving and changing and growing. He's, he's hitting all his chakras and very often the jokes are about switching perspectives on the same reality. Yeah. Like I think of him saying, do sharks know that we can see their fins? <laughs> and that's, uh, that's an interperspectival uh, friction. And that's the whole point of the joke is an interperspective conjunction. So, you know, like w- whatever he is personally and whatever shadow comes forward in people for whatever reason, true or false, uh, there's a lot of arguably integral level contents in the way he cognitively frames those jokes. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think Louis um, in particular has a way of kind of being connected to his lower animalistic self, but also kind of just being aware of it in a comedic way and being sensitive to, to kind of different ways that he thinks that he's both attached with and identify with and not um, that resonate with integral uh, uh, to me. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. And, um, and also just him as a, as an artist and a creator, like there's something that it's, that's inspiring. That's always been a little inspiring to me. He's very, he's very creative. Like he, he produces things himself. He's very like DIY. Um, and for me, like I studied Alfred North Whitehead. Like I, I mean, I got into integral, like a, a lot of people did through Ken Wilber, but I, after I read all of Wilber's material, uh, I read a lot of like other stuff. And I, after Wilber started getting more repetitive to me, I started gravitating to uh, like Alfred North Whitehead who, no, not a lot of people were talking about and ultimately whitehead for him like creativity is at the center of 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 uh of his like theory and i like that a lot like i like i like the idea of prioritizing the creative above all um and i'm i kind of use that as a as a way to navigate my reality uh, is to just put creativity front and center and support and do things that support that and i think louis in that in that sense um, embodies that because at least before, I mean, now he's kind of emerging back into the public, um, but he was always very just creative in the sense of doing, producing his own shows and not having to rely on on a a corporate body to to do that as well. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, Prior to the scandal and, and maybe going forward, who knows, yeah. It seemed like he stood for trying new things. Trying yeah. Difficulty level, trying to do it your own way, trying to be more authentic with it. And it also seems like uh, he underwent a shift in the way he did comedy. And I've seen him attribute that to George Carlin saying, throw out your old jokes and start again mm-hmm. each time. Mm-hmm. And how That's terrified exactly. he was to try to do that, but how that was the moment when he really went to another level in terms of being a humorist. That's true. And then throwing out his material every year and re- rewriting new material and then always keeping it fresh and, and, and innovative. That's a super important, like that, that's something that's really inspiring to me. And I think f- for all artists too, like just the ability to be innovative and be inventive and put out new material um, um, and then throw it out. That, that, that's cool. That's cool to me. That, that's integral to me. Yeah. Integral is a tricky thing because it's, it's easy to get the, you know, the concept, knowing about the philosophy, confused with what it's actually discussing. Yeah. And one of the big problems in my mind in analyzing levels is people tend to analyze the, the nominal content of the level. Like people who are talking about this are at this level. Mm. Really, they should be looking more at the style in which people are embodying those things. Exactly. Because, exactly. I mean, I always had this issue with art. Like what's spiritual art? Yeah. <laughs> my drawing of the Buddha or is it Van Gogh's painting of dirt? Yes. It, like the, the depth of the style is distinct from the depth of the content. Exactly. <laughs> and, and I 100% agree. And I think that's, that's, what, that's what attracts me towards, um, like I love, I love integral theory and all this stuff, but what, I'm really, what, what really inspires me is kind of particular role models in certain fields that embody integral without having to 
talk about those concepts um, and it's kind of integral under the surface. And, um, you know, the, the, the novelists, the filmmakers, the comedians, the musicians that happen to embody these concepts without directly talking about these things. Um, and I mean, that's a great aspiration for, for our venue as well. And, and we're, we're a venue, but we're also like a production center. Uh, we, we have a green screen. We offer like free use of video studio for people who want to use it. We like to collaborate with a lot of people. Um, and I, I think integral, like creating integral art is lofty, but I completely agree with what you're saying. Like it doesn't, integral art doesn't mean like conceptually integral art, but something that happens to embody it in a, in a different way. So, yeah. You think, um, who's integral under the surface? Like when you look yeah. around, who you think that person, whether it's true or not, because you never really know what's going on in somebody. But yeah. where, where do you get that vibe and you think, yeah, maybe, maybe that guy, maybe her, maybe him? I mean, I, th I think um, Damon Lindelof, uh, the creator of, of Lost and Watchmen. I think Christopher Nolan, uh, obviously the creator of Inception, Interstellar, Terrence Malick. I'm naming fil filmmakers right now. Um, but those three in particular stand out as particularly like making integrally under the surface kind of art. Um, as you said, Louis is a comedian. Com comedy to me is trickier. And I feel like co comedy has a lot to do with social awareness. So in a way, the best comedians, the best comedians are probably integral under the surface, like John Mulaney or Louis CK, because they have the most social kind of awareness uh but i would have to analyze their jokes in particular to like really like kind of deep deeper go down into that musicians i really like trent reznor there's something about him uh, the dude from nine inch nails that resonates and if you look at some of his interviews and kind of his progression over time he talks about the kind of spiritual journey that he's that he's taken that that to me aligns a lot with with what a lot of integral people talk about um i don't know how familiar you are with nine inch nails uh somewhat familiar uh i'm thinking right now of uh an interview with trent reznor i saw about his work on the lost highway soundtrack and somebody said okay. to him how what was it like to work with david lynch and he said well imagine this a guy comes up to you and he's drawn a box with three zigzags in it and he says can you make it sound more like this? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's a very good Lynch impression too. <laughs> I, I think I, I'd put Lynch in an arguably integral under the surface. Situation. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like that you mentioned Lindelof. Lindelof's an intriguing guy to me. Like, I love The Watchmen. I loved Leftovers. Oh man, I love Leftovers too. That, and there's a thing there. Like a lot of people, when they read integral philosophy or any kind of spiritual or philosophical stuff they often think there's going to be a light, inspiring, positive message, that that's the aesthetic you're expecting. But when you see it come from the artists, it's always got darkness, creepiness. It's always challenging and strange and surrealistic. And you think, what the hell? I didn't know they were going to go there. <laughs> and that's how you honor it as something higher in an art form. Right, exactly. And I think that in, in the art form, as you say, like the, the ability to – to go into that creepiness and go into that shadow um, that, that makes it more complete and it should go into that. It's more enjoyable. It's more, it feels more complete. Um, Leftovers is freaking amazing. Like the way that it go that, that uh, Kevin, the character like goes into these weird alternate worlds, like kind of these afterlife um, dimensions and, and dream worlds in a sense is very Lynchian. And uh, obviously there's some, there's themes of, of religion and afterlife and, and, and just how people handle, um, uh, chaos and, uh, um, what's it called? Just, just, uh, ab absurdly. Um, and that show explores that better than probably any other show that I, that I know. I know as an author, uh, David Foster Wallace to me has had very integral themes under the surface. Um, yeah, and, and you can just, and he was also very Lynch uh, inspired as too. There's a lot of them, but but that that's who ultimately I'm 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 into is those under the surface kind of people. 
uh, thinking about it from the integral perspective, the bottom two quadrants have this interesting distinction, where on the one hand, there's this mutuality, right? There's a shared intersubjective experience of collective reality. And on the other hand, there's something like the objective system of how people interact with each other. So one of the interesting questions for me is always to distinguish between the, the art of getting people together in a shared experience and what do we really need as systems among people in the world? Because you can yeah. have people, people can come together and have a great time and be a very dumb group. Or <laughs> they can get together and they can have a, a, a truly beautiful group high that never becomes anything in any of their lives and doesn't That's help true. the world. That's true. So when, when you say this, I'm thinking of, now I'm thinking of the business of it and what we're trying to do on a business level um, and how we're kind of, how we're trying to participate with different um, systems to better integrate into what the world gives us. Um, part of that is like experimenting with different business models and trying to like, for example, we, we operate as a nonprofit in a way. Um, um, and, and that enables us to, to seek grants that enable us to give funding to artists to help support their art, to work with us in our venue, to produce that art. Um, we don't 100% do that to the best of our abilities, but we're trying to do that. Um, and if we could succeed at that, it would enable us to produce a lot more art and, and uh, uh, you know, and enable just the, 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 the production of more creativity and to support that. Um, but you know, it's difficult, but my mind is drawn to, you know, that's, that's, that's what I think about most right now is the business side of things and how do we support us as a venue and also the artists that we're actually trying to support. And then the greater media systems that we're, that we're, um, trying to connect with. Um, and that's something that's a kind of the most exciting part of it. Like, cause that's where it feels like the work really comes to life when the New York times acknowledges it. And, and that's kind of, that's also kind of cultural and not lower right. Um, but, but it feels like the ultimate validation when you get money for, for what you're doing. And, and then, you know, the, the greater systems of the world are actually supporting you in supporting artists and uh, um, trying to get creative works out there. If you were to suddenly have that jump to the next level of financing, <laughs> what would you try to do? What's your dream project that you just don't have the resources for at the moment? Yeah, that's a great question. It would enable me to think and it would enable me and Amy to think um, a lot bigger about the kinds of events we're hosting, the kind of talent that we're reaching. Right now, our our attitude towards talent is we pretty much are, we're very inclusive and that that's maybe more like postmodern than integral. Um, but we kind of accept everyone. We, f we figure out where to put them in one of our shows but I think that if we had more money, we would target people who can make a bigger kind of bang with the events. Um, so we might try to reach out to Trent Reznor or something. And uh, it would enable us to put on more exciting and bigger events. It would enable us to have the events have more meaningful impact through just spectacular um, um, effects, like the lighting and, and kind of like light show and music that goes around with it and having a bigger venue essentially. And uh, in terms of uh, the video content we're trying to create uh, right now, we, we rent out video where we give it away for free. Um, and it's a very small video studio that enables itself well for music videos and, and green screen YouTube video content, which is only a very small amount of uh, uh, that covers only a small, small spectrum of possible art we'd probably get a much bigger video studio with a bigger green screen and just kind of more warehouse uh, space so that we could produce better content essentially. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I, I would also have to like think if I, if we actually had the money, then, then it would be one thing, but I, I don't want, I don't want to think necessarily 
until we actually have that, it feels like a hypothetical experiment. So, but you know, it would, it would definitely enable us to think bigger. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's always a tricky thing. Cause on the one hand you think, well, uh, you know, I get closer to the realities I want if I can clarify them for myself. Yeah, right. On the other hand, obviously I'm going to do the things I want to do if I have resources. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I shouldn't, well, I shouldn't go. I, that's the first step. I should be putting my attention there. But on the other hand, is that an expression of my anxiety of not wanting to go into the fantasy version of what I really want by trying to right. focus on the practical? It's, right. It's a yeah. Nice it's, edge. <laughs> exactly. Right. And you know, maybe in that deal scenario, we would try to create something like like the leftovers, like a HBO show, and then we would have like an immersive Disney World. Honestly, like I feel like Disney World, Disney is is the highest example of of someone that's do, doing something at a much 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 higher level because they are an immersive Disney world is an immersive event space. We would obviously do it differently than Disney world. Um, but they've already done it. And, and they're also not just an immersive event space, but a production center. And they're of course, they of course have billions of dollars to produce all kinds of entertainment. That's the highest, that's the high end of what we could do, but in our own kind of way. Tiny cupboard land. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, do you listen to podcasts? What do you listen to? Um, yeah, I mean, I listen right now. I'm mostly just reading a lot. I'm, I'm right now actually reading a lot of, um, biographies of politicians because I want to actually understand better the lower right space. And, um, and that's maybe the hardest space to understand and grasp because it's all about very practical, concrete stuff that's often localized to your culture. Um, so I'm reading the biographies of Andrew Yang. Actually, this is not a biography. Um, this is just his book, Andrew Yang's book, The War on Normal People. Um, also, Andrew Cuomo. I've read Bernie Sanders' books. I read Elizabeth Warren's book. I'm just trying to get like an understanding of of how different politicians think so I can better uh, relate to government systems. And, um, yeah, right now I'm going through, through Andrew Yang and Andrew Cuomo. I don't know why they're both called Andrew, but I'm going through their books. I like Andrew Yang quite a lot. Yeah. He's fun. He's definitely a higher level character with a lot of systemic insight and good humor. Yeah. Um, that, there's an interesting thing there that's comparable to what we were talking about in art, right? In terms of that difference between style and content, because, most of the people you listed would be classified as progressive. But then there's a question of what actually is a progressive? Because is it somebody who says progressive words, and gets <laughs> shout outs to progressive values and puts a few things down on their policy list? Or is it something else in the style and character of the person that authenticates who's a progressive, regardless of what their positions are? Right, Exactly. And I don't, I don't know if there's any examples of an integral politician that I can really pull from and understand right now. So maybe the best I can do is learning from um, these progressives. Like right now, the goal is just to learn enough to be able to integrate into the integrate better into the government systems that I'm that I'm I'm around right that I'm surrounded by right now. Um, it's not necessarily to create an an integral version of that until I can actually participate that fully at the extent that I would want to. It's a tricky thing to think about integral politics because you've got these, there's these two ways to go at it. And one is I take all of the stages in my mind and I kind of equalize and balance them out. And I'm going to be the, the reasonable overseer of the left and the right at all the stages. Right. The other approach is it's not integral unless it's at least green. <laughs> <laughs> and we really need to double down on that one even if you said i'd like conservative traditional modern and postmodern to be kind of balanced in an integral framework that would involve seriously amplifying the progressive position yeah for sure. <laughs> and Absolutely. kind of at the expense of the liberal position right which is a scary thing at the moment because obviously we have to try to stop Trump from destroying the system. But Joe Biden looks like a character who perpetuates the system that gave us Trump in the first right. place. Right. Very true. So how do you draw that line? Like if there's going forward, if progressive has to take away from liberal, how do you do that? That's a risk whenever it happens. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And I don't know. I think that for me, my, my goal is just to learn the system enough that I can feel like I'm participating in it and not on the outside of it. Um, and I feel like if you ask most people how, how do I engage in politics more, they'll tell you just vote or something like that. Or I don't know, volunteer for this campaign. But to me, that's like not enough. Like I, I want a more, I want a more fully integrated um, um, relationship with the government. Um, I don't know what exactly that form that will take place in yet, but I know that it's, I know that simply volunteering or simply like voting uh, doesn't feel like enough of a relationship with the government for me to feel like I can eventually have the impact that I want to have um regardless of poli- regardless of what policies that i would i would create that's a whole separate story the harder part to me is just breaking in to that government space which feels like a very um exclusive place that's weird and hard to break into not that i would want to run for anything but just yeah. just yeah well okay here's a question with sort of two facets and the question is how important it is it to you to be attuned to the historical moment? Because on the one hand, it seems like um, politics and particularly the uh, progressive struggle in politics is part of this historical moment that we're going through. A lot of people I talk to are opening up to or leaning in that direction. At the same time, when we talk about uh, art and generating events, um, a lot of the great event generators seem to have used the moment as a coordinating factor. Like I'm thinking of the Beatles, right? There was this time period where you had these guys, they had this capacity, they were definitely on top of their game. And then they shifted into these guys who were deliberately making art that mm-hmm. was uh, attempting to embody where the world was at that time. Mm-hmm. Now we think of them as the, as the avataric embodiments of the 60s or whatever it was and and then later when they split up and went their separate ways there was still good mus- music there sure but it wasn't the beatles anymore because they weren't coordinating a group of people together in attunement with the historical moment mm. yeah i mean i think i would like to be someone who's um like on the leading edge of culture and having my art and my events um facilitate that leading edge in whatever capacity. So I guess, I guess in some way, um, I guess, yeah, I guess in some way, like, I don't know if I want to embody the, the um, historical moment with the art, but I want, I would want to push people in the direction that I think I want them to go. Um, or I think, or, or just feels like fun or inter- or creative to me. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to quite answer that. Okay. Um, let's let's maybe speculate a little bit about what events look like at different stages of development. Yeah, that's a good that's a good idea. Uh, what's a what's a tribal or barbarian type event in your mind? I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is is definitely like a sports event, um, and any kind of sports event feels tribal tribalist to me. Um, you know, watching a, a basketball game or a boxing match, um, something like that. Um, there's something about, and it's fun. Like I, 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 I'll go to basketball games. And I'll, I'll watch the Brooklyn Nets or something. And there's something about being in the space with a bunch, like tons of other people, being in a stadium, and and just kind of being connected to them at the tribal level. That's fun. Um, it's not intimate, but it's tribalistic and it's cool. And uh, obviously a lot of people love sports. I like sports. I like playing sports. And um, yeah, it definitely feels like sports are the embodiment of a, a kind of a tribalistic uh, event. Yeah, that's a, it's an ambiguous one for me, sports. Um, I and mean, it comes down to the fact that there's an ambiguity in what we mean by tribal. Right. Do we mean like really like tribes or do we just mean some kind of identification group? Yeah, I just mean more of an identification group. But it yeah, also brings out that kind of that aggressive kind of spirit too. One of the interesting things historically was that this uh, that traditionalist society, the big uh, orthodox nationalist kingdoms, were able to take over the tribes. 
Mm. That was the next level. So the tribes had intertribal competitions, which sometimes were warfare-like and sometimes more benign. But the next level had to absorb that somehow and put it on its own terms. And I see the, the nationalistic level, so to say the patriotic level, um, more represented in a lot of big level sports today. Mm. Like when people come in and they say, like you have a team, you have a football team and everybody who wears the uniform, it's a very abstract team is on that team. And if they get traded, suddenly I don't like them anymore. Now he's an asshole because he's in Miami and wearing a different shirt. Very true. Right? So that's a very abstract team compared to an actual tribe where you have some real investment with each other. Like gang warfare, those people live together. They're on the same team or you're actually in the same clan. There's this real, we're really on the same team, whereas yeah, yeah. there's this symbolic a uh, mega team thing that goes on in the way that traditional religion goes on. That's true. And I, and I, and I guess from what you're saying, like the tribal event then isn't really an event more. So it's just kind of a loose gathering of people who happen to be like a gang, but who have to be doing something um, as part of their natural day, but it's not like an event in the same way that like uh, going to a sporting match is an event. Yeah, I would guess that at each level, if you were to look back from that level at the previous levels, you'd think those don't quite count as events. <laughs> They're not organized the way we're organizing them, and the next level is going to think that about you. Mm. You didn't quite pull off a real event. Yeah. <laughs> you just get some stuff. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. But at the same time, um, in a way, like the sporting event feels more le- like it feels like a more legitimate event than some weird poetry night for example um like and i think a lot of progressives would agree like uh, like a progressive poetry night um it would feel more informal and and, you know inclusive and and, and intimate um but it wouldn't be like it wouldn't have this kind of hype and kind of pretentiousness i guess of the of the sporting event but but it would feel more meaningful and, and for them in the sense that it feels more intimate and feels more like we're sharing feelings, we're sharing thoughts. Um, yeah. And I, and I do feel like, I do feel like uh, to theorize it more, the concert outings and the, um, the kind of artistic events that people go to, that feels like a, that feels like a progressive form of going to events. Um, I don't, but I skipped the modernist level. So I don't know. I don't know what that would be. Yeah, those are interesting. Definitely that leap from tribal to national or kingdom um, is is an increase in scale and coordination, right? Now everybody's wearing the same shirt and there's 10,000 instead of a thousand. So (laughs) it would be understandable that there's an increase in perceived intensity. Mm Mm-hmm. And then when you get to something like green, it's very understandable that, I mean, there could be massive green events, right? Sure. Imagine what it would be like if Bernie won the election or yeah, for sure. in the world did Earth Hour or something like that. Yeah, right? sure, sure. Get like a, a Beatles event, a Beatles concert or something like yeah. that. But at the same yeah. time, there's something about green that focuses on decentralization, on, on the body, on intimacy, on in folding in things that were previously excluded because they seem too small and personal is that whole move is very characteristic of that pluralistic consciousness. Yeah, very true. So in a way that you're, it's expected to be smaller and more identity based. Um, yeah. And, and, and more kind of embodied and kind of emotional. Yeah. And I agree. It's tricky to think about what, what a modernist event is. Because a lot of the modernist event is actually the, uh, the blue, amber, traditionalist, conformist people reacting to a modern event. Like, mm-hmm. here's the Titanic sailing away in a, as a symbol of modern progress. But all those people who are waving and cheering from the dock, are those the modernists or are they the local traditionalists? Right. <laughs> it's hard to say. I mean, the, the one thing that's, that my mind is going to is like what people going to a bar or people going to a movie theater yeah. where um, you, you have like, there's entertainment that's, that's kind of given to you and is expected to do the work for you um, 
for whatever reason that feels modernist because it's kind of like, it's a system of, of, I guess, production and capitalism and value um, where you're kind of the, the victim of it. How about this? The Super Bowl <laughs> halftime show. Yes. Yes, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's, that's, uh, that sounds, that's definitely a good example. That's interesting because it's, um, it's high finance, it's high performance, it's high tech, and it also represents uh, the superstructure of the financers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it certainly does. Yeah, it's, it's even sponsored by, by them. So, um, yeah, and I guess there's a lot of events in that capacity. Maybe bigger music concerts um, and kind of more mainstream music events and sporting events even. Um, bleed into that for sure there's a there was a spanish philosopher during the spanish civil war called jose ortega y gasset and he theorized a lot about modernity and the coming of the mass individual and he sort of thought about modernity itself as an event right mm -hmm. now there's seven billion instead of half a billion people now everywhere you go that used to be a sacred place is full of people there's just this huge thing has happened. And sometimes I think of the movie Titanic as kind of yeah. emblematic of modernity. Like modernity is the iceberg. It, yeah. it, you know, something happened. History was going along and it hit this thing mm. and it spills out. And what spills out is all these class divisions, all these new machines, all this new spirit. That's a good way to think about it. Modernity itself might be the event. I like that. That's a, that's a nice way to think about it. And in, in that way, yeah, an event can be more broader and more kind of abstract. Um, and, and that it's just kind of anything that you put out into the world and then, and then people respond to it. That's an event. Uh, what about the event of the truly peculiar? Like on the one hand, you know, Trump's the president now. You're like that guy, <laughs> that guy from Celebrity Apprentice is the president now. Okay, that's a that's a peculiarity that we all stand before together. Mm -hmm. Very similar in my mind to something like the aliens have landed. <laughs> that's a peculiarity we now all stand before together. Yeah, and 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 in a way, it's like also like coronavirus. In a way, it's like just something mm -hmm. that shakes up reality, and then we have to respond to it. I don't know. I think I think of these as kind of like almost like testers or kind of just curveballs that are thrown at us. And then, and then in a way we can respond to it in a way that strengthens us or, or maybe highlights the realities that are, that are going on more. Um, like with, with uh, the virus, um, it seems to have highlighted the kind of social media culture that we're in and the, and the kind of uh, reliance that we have on digital media um, and, and the isolation that comes along with that. And, and we're experiencing the, the full effects of that along with um, some of the inequalities that come with just income inequality in general. It's, it's, sh it's shine, it's shine. It has shined a, a, a light on some of that. And in a way, I think it's made some progress in, in getting Republicans and Democrats to uh, come to agreement on certain things about giving people money, which progressives have been talking about for a long time. Um, so these peculiar peculiarities, I can't even say that word, um, are kind of just curveballs that are thrown at us that we have to respond to, or we, we can respond to in, in whatever way. On, on the one hand, there's something about surprises, black swans that you can never prepare for, right? Things are right. going to catch you off guard, and like a virus comes, there's only so much you can do to prepare. If, you're, yeah. if your immune system is vulnerable, that's it, and it's a tragedy, and nobody yeah. should argue that you should have been more prepared, you know? <laughs> but on the other hand, there is a sense where we can build up strength, we can build up flexibility, we can build up preparation. Is it your impression that people who practice coming together in events like the ones you're trying to coordinate, that those people have an edge in terms of dealing with peculiarities and disruptions of the system as they come forward. Does it get, does it lend them a skill set, or does it basically make no difference? 
I don't think, yeah, I, don't, I think it makes no difference. <laughs> I wish it did. I wish I could say it did, but uh, unfortunately it's, it's so random and unpredictable that um, I, I don't think there's any consistency with, with, with the two. Like some people might be kind of, some people who might come to our events are kind of like, oh shit, I don't know what to do now. Um, but it does, it does in fact require though a certain open-mindedness to come to an event where you don't know where you maybe come alone or you don't know who's there. And that, I think that open-mindedness leads itself to being a more adaptable kind of person who can adapt to a situation as it comes. Um, but it also, it, I, don't, I don't know if it's necessarily the, the case. It would be interesting to, you know, think about what would make events more likely to dispose people to have those skills. Hmm. You know, what, what would be an event where a person walks away from it 1% better at dealing with disruptions of reality. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I mean, the philosophy events certainly get to the meat of like, let's, let's really get into our thoughts more so than any music or comedy event does. And cause those require, if you really want to take away meaning from a comedy or music event outside of the momentary enjoyment that you experience, you have to sit down and analyze it later and do some sort of philosophy and it feels like philosophy is the thing that can get people to walk away and think better and kind of, and kind of emerge people to the next level in terms of at least how they're thinking. Um, but at the same time, philosophy is dry to most people. And I don't, I, I love philosophy, but I don't want to do, I don't, I don't want to, there's a reason like I left academia and, and um, why we're just starting to do philosophy events now it's because I think as a kind of piece of culture, it needs to have this certain kind of funner element to it that, that integrates more into the greater art scene. Um, and, and just, and, and feels like kind of a more fun uh, thing to do, I guess. So if I'm going to do a philosophy thing with you, how do yeah. we make that more fun and a little bit less of that academic well, philosophy? I, it already is. I mean, basically the fact that we're making it social, you're coming next week and you're coming to host a philosophy salon. The fact that it's social is inherently making it a more fun thing. Cause you're going to be, you know, surrounded by 20 people or something and it's going to be very interactive and immersive. Um, and that naturally just makes it accessible or social or, or it, it makes it concrete. Yeah. I like that. And I'm going to try to uh, keep my opening a little bit short. You know, a couple of years ago, maybe half a decade now, I was at this integral conference and I was there to give this talk. And the previous night to the talk, I was out at a party with all the volunteers. <laughs> and I said, I don't think I have enough time to deliver my talk. And there was this wonderful girl there. And she said, why don't you just do the question and answer portion? Mm. Thought, Fantastic. So I just went in, I announced the name and then I opened it to questions. We ended up covering just about all the stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you know what's funny? I was actually there. I was at your Q and A. Were you? Yeah, I was literally nice. there. <laughs> um, so I was, I was in the audience during that. So that that shows that was in San Francisco, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. I, and I, what the fuck is meta theory? <laughs> yes, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember actually being very. Um, um, it was it was a really good way to format the the your 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 talk it was just q a and it was very lively it was very engaging and and you got you know it was more engaging than you just putting on a whole extra thing and if you want to do it that way next week then i'm, well, I'm i'll do i'll do a little intro like i'll, I'll bring the concepts to discuss yeah um, but there's something for me that's really valuable in that like first of all it's scary to me to do that <laughs> yeah Right. But so, but I like that. Like, then I get something out of it because what do I really get out of telling someone else ideas I've already thought about? Yeah. <laughs> How does that benefit me at all? <laughs> you actually get to open your perspective up to challenge or inquiry. Exactly. Or then I got to improvise. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there's something and exactly to bring it back. There's something that's fun and lively about improv improvisation or just un unpredictability um, that, that brings philosophy to life in a certain way. Um, and yeah, and that, that, that brings that, that's, that's what events, that's, what's great about events. Seems to me like we're getting near the end. <laughs> Is there anything else you think we should talk about? Um, 
No, I, I, I think we've covered a lot of ground. Of course, that we can continue the conversation in different ways. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I wish, I wish there was like an integral media channel that was, again, un, beneath the surface integral or um, something that that uh, produced art or like media or whatever that was integral without using integral concepts. Um, and maybe in the future we'll get that. I'm sure in the future we'll, we'll, we'll continue to build that. That's what I'm trying to build um, in part through the events and the production that we're doing. And um, yeah, it's fun. I'm just excited to see. Uh, and I'm glad you're doing this, this series because it's an awesome idea. What would you ask the next person I interview? What would you like to know from somebody who's podcasting or YouTubing or hosting salons or whatever? <laughs> using the internet as a primary broadcasting mechanism where they try to get the energy and experience and thoughts and insights out that they want. I would say like, how are they reaching people that aren't familiar with integral thought? Um, and how are they, how are they kind of framing this conversation in a wider culture of maybe just progressivism um, and, or, or something maybe a little bigger than that? but how are we getting these integral thoughts to appeal to the kind of wider audience? Terrific. This has been a really fun chat, Matt. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks Layman. Yeah. Awesome chat. I uh, really appreciate you inviting me to it. All right. Cheers, man. Good luck. <laughs> you too. <laughs>